We're good. All right, uh, so this is uh, the collaboration game, time-tested techniques for agile release planning. I am uh, Andrew Lindsay. I'm currently the VP of product at uh, New Mode, a Canadian company that does advocacy tech, uh, working mainly with NGOs. And prior to that, I was at the Linux Foundation, Open Media, and uh, McGill University. And in all those contexts, I've been working on agile teams, and uh, throughout that, got a bunch of different letters attached to my name that have something to do with Agile and Scrum development. And uh, yeah, keep running into problems and creating uh, presentations as I find solutions for them. Uh, slides uh, on Bitly at uh, Collaboration Game. Uh, so, just a quick question: Is, is everybody in this room kind of working on agile teams already and familiar with the the basics of all that? Is is there anybody that's not? All right. Maybe a little. All right. I, I'll go through very brief definitions just to make sure that we're all on roughly the same page. But I'm not going to delve into that stuff so much. Uh, if if anybody has any questions or anything, it's Clarification. Let me know, and I'll be happy to uh, to do my best to clarify. Uh, so, Agile is a principled, collaborative approach to to developing software or products of some sort. Uh, Scrum is a, an iterative framework for for building things. Uh, quite often, software and a sprint within Scrum is is, a, is an iterative. Uh, 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 undertaking of, of building an you know, allotment of software, I guess. Uh, uh, usually two weeks long, sometimes one, sometimes three, sometimes four. Uh, a user story often used in, in Scrum is a, is a way of describing something that we're going to, to build. It usually takes the form of uh, as X, I want Y, so that I can Z. It doesn't have to. It's not meant to uh, to to completely, utterly describe what it is that you're, you're, you're building or undertaking. It's just meant to be a sort of a bookmark or a placeholder for a conversation about what it is that you're building, something to remind you of the specifics of what you're undertaking so that you can have that conversation with, with stakeholders and with, with other uh, development teammates, that sort of thing. Uh, product backlog, giant list of, of all the things that, uh, that you want to build over time usually ordered from top to bottom by, by uh, business value, prioritized by uh, what you're going to take on first, what's going to give your organization, your stakeholders, your customers the, the most immediate uh, value and things that are you know more debatable uh, at the bottom of that list. Uh, and then Sprint Backlog, every time uh, you go into one of those iterations in Agile, you're, you're sitting down with the, the development team and you're, you're Agreeing to a, a sort of contract of the the things you're going to take on in your your, your sprint, your iteration, your two week period, or whatever it might be, and uh, and uh, making sure that they're brought into the sprint with an appropriate level of detail. Uh, and the whole thing looks roughly something like this. So let's say in two weeks you're doing a big circle. Where at the start of that circle you're you're uh, having a sprint planning meeting. If you're you're going through the things you're adding to your sprint, Sprint backlog, making sure that they fit in with the, the empirically determined capacity that your team has and story points or whatever unit of measurement you've chosen to work with and uh, doing cyclical daily development where you're usually doing stand-up or something like that to check in with your team and, and make sure that everything's on track and at the end of that doing some sort of a, a demo where you're saying this is what we built and this is how it sort of meets what we were aiming to build and, and usually also something like a retro where you're, you're coming and looking at your processes and saying how can we be more efficient about what we've done here and, and, and improve it as we go into our, uh, our next iteration. And so we're constantly uh, improving. All that makes sense to everybody to kind of the norm. Cool. All right. Uh, so uh, who here is, is doing uh, something along the lines of, of agile release planning currently? So not everybody. I so I got my my Scrum Master certification, I think, darn near ten years ago, and it was a three-day 
process as it often is, and the first two days covered pretty much everything in Scrum, and then the third day was like this tacked on uh, release planning workshop that I couldn't make it because I had some sort of social conflict or something like that. And, uh, and so admittedly for the first few years that I was working in Agile, release planning wasn't something that I gave a whole lot of attention to, probably because I missed that day of the workshop. Um, but uh, I think I've come to realize over time that it's, it's something that if employed correctly solves a lot of problems that came up for me without having it as a, a tool in my uh, toolbox, so to speak. Um, so it's it's more longer or medium term planning. It's it's typically three to six months increments. Uh, uh, the place I currently work, we do it uh, at a quarterly level. Quarterly level, I think that's fairly common. Uh, it's badly named uh, because uh, in a day and an age where we're doing continuous integration, uh, continuous deployment, a lot of us, or at least you know maybe deploying more frequently than once every quarter, uh, it, it doesn't make a lot of sense in terms of, of it being tied to when you're actually releasing software or whatnot. But it does make a great deal of sense in terms of being able to have some sort of medium level opportunity to, to look at what you're you're building out and to, to, to develop a, a picture that your sprints in a given quarter or a given release uh, can flow from. Um, so how does release planning differ from sprint planning? Uh, sprint planning, as I mentioned, you know, one to four weeks, often two. Release planning, three to six months, often three. Uh, sprint plans, typically we're trying to set those in stone, right? Because it's a, it's a contract between the dev team and, and stakeholders, the, 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 the business uh, side of the organization, uh, about what we're going to achieve in, in, say, a two-week period. So we occasionally, you know, something comes up very urgent, we haven't built an appropriate padding for it or something like that, and, and, and it has to be undertaken, but we resist as much as we can typically changing that sprint plan so that we can accomplish what it is that we set out to accomplish at the start of that two week period, or three week period, four week period, what have you. Um, release planning on the other hand uh, is, is kind of the plan that doesn't survive the, the battlefield, so to speak. It's, uh, something that, uh, that you look at at a medium level, uh, maybe in three month increments, but uh, you know, recognizing that, uh, that agile is about fluidity and that things are gonna change and that, uh, that uh, it's about being able to, to be versatile and to react to, to different needs that come up as you're building out a product, that sort of a thing. So it is something that's, that's not necessarily looked at as, as sort of uh, uh, unchangeable as, as, as set in stone. Uh, granularity, um, it's kind of interesting with release planning, with, with sprint level planning, when, when we're trying to plan out a sprint, we want to make sure that we've got an exceptional level of granularity. Ideally, anything that comes into our sprint when we're going through that sprint planning process, you know, we've, we've had everybody in the room or, or on the, the Zoom call or whatever it is where you're doing your sprint planning, uh, pitch in and make sure that, that we've sort of considered it from all angles, that we've detailed what it is that we're building out, that uh, that, uh, that any sort of unanswered questions are answered so that when we actually start doing the work, we've got as much information as possible. Not that we're not going to have conversations and, and go back and reconsider things as, as we go through the sprint, but we want to have granular small tasks or, or tickets that we're taking on in a sprint so that it's... Uh, allowing us to do that detailed level of work. Um, whereas with release planning, it's, it's more at like the epic level or the, you know, the, the, the big picture high level. Um, although there are opportunities as you're doing release planning to, to get more detail and to start to get more granularity as you're putting that stuff together. Any questions on any of that stuff so far? Make sense? Uh, so our product backlog, uh, if we're not doing release planning, this probably still looks pretty familiar. It's, uh, it's more granular at the top, less granular at the bottom. Uh, but uh, we can see here, you know, our latest release has that granular at the top, and, and our releases are typically, you know, lined up linearly against that backlog. Uh, 
So I, I asked the question, uh, what sort of problems do we think we might encounter uh, if we're sitting down in a room full of, of uh, stakeholders or, or customers or, or whoever really is involved in these conversations in your context <coughs> and, and trying to, to move a conversation forward at that sort of medium level about what it is that we're going to do in the next three months and what our priorities are going to be and, and, and uh, what we're going to undertake. Anyone have any ideas around that? Or go for it. Some stakeholders won't only exist in a perpetual now. And for them, everything is now. And in my experience, some of them will try to jam their idea of what should be real now into, into all conversations. And so if you sit down with them and try to talk long term, sometimes people are very focused on very specific outcomes and not willing to divert their attention to lift their eyes to the horizon and see a little further out. Sounds accurate. And I, I think the, the perpetual now part makes it sound very sort of zen as well. <laughs> uh, did you have something to add as well? Just thinking loudly you on, you know, basically with my projects, I feel thought clarity with the stakeholders is normally not there at the initial stages. <laughs> However, you know, and making a release plan and giving it with the timeline and then the roadmap, etc., becomes very difficult because the themselves were not clear as in what actually they want has been, you know, the challenging thing for me at least. I can see that for sure. And and I think again with with agile as opposed to waterfall, it's you know, people may still be used to sort of getting promised this this very strict set of things that we're gonna yeah. build out. Uh, not that we necessarily regularly achieve that when we were doing waterfall stuff in the past anyway, but uh, yeah, any other thoughts? And depending on the organization, different stakeholders have different priorities. Yeah, I think that's what brought me to this myself. Um, I can remember uh, a previous organization I worked for where there were three very distinct departments and uh, and we had development resources uh, to serve really only one dev team uh, and then so there were often conversations about you know where should we split our focus over the course of the next three months should we undertake this large-scale uh, initiative for for department one at the expense of something for department two department three uh, I think especially small organizations, you know, if you've only got one dev team, if you've got a limited amount of money to spend, if you, like an awful lot of small organizations, like an awful lot of startups, if, if you've got really big ideas, you know, we, we, the company I work for now, we, we have absolutely no lack of ideas about things that we want to do, and it's, it's a very substantial list. So. Oftentimes, it's it's trying to figure out you know where is that business value for the organization as a whole, as opposed to you know this one particular initiative that we're undertaking or or things like that. Uh, and so I've come to think of it in terms of, of the, uh, this is a little bit sort of tongue in cheek, but of this sort of disgruntlement uh, triumvirate, in, in that uh, you've got multiple stakeholders, you've got divergent needs, and, and you've got limited. Uh, development capacity and so I went searching uh, for solutions on on how to address that and uh, really it was was in agile release planning that I I, uh, I found answers that have worked for me uh, and, and those center around things like ensuring that, that all stakeholders holders have an opportunity to share their viewpoints that you don't have uh, one particularly vocal person, a group of persons, sort of outshining everybody else in the conversation, uh, considering uh, all the, the sort of candidate opportunities or, or bits of work that you're going to undertake from a variety of perspectives, uh, uh, empowering uh, the stakeholders themselves to, to make these decisions in a, in a collaborative process and, and not a competitive process. Um, and, and so in most respects, uh, where I found the most success is, is looking at uh, at uh, things that 
fall into the category of, of games uh, in, in agile planning. Uh, I suspect uh, a lot of you folks probably do like uh, scrum poker, story point estimation, that sort of a thing. Uh, so things that, that extend from that tradition um, and that that have a, a similar benefit. Um, I did my my PMP before I started getting into, uh, which is like a fancy project management certification, before I started getting into to Scrum and Agile in a big way. And, and there was a period of time, as I understand it, in the 90s, where it was really in vogue to, if you were like a big organization, 300 person IT team, to, uh, to bring in consultants to do something called uh, wideband Delphi estimation, which was you would pay this consultant group to come in and they would like grab each developer and isolate them in an interview room and ask them all sorts of questions about estimating how, how big a particular piece of, of the product we were building out would take to, to, to build out and then they would compile that data and, and run different algorithms against it, I suppose, or, or something like that, but they would try to, to, to merge all those estimates together without having, at least initially, significant influence of one person against another. And, and I think the brilliance of, of that sort of story poker game is that it captures all that stuff that people were maybe paying way too much money for in the 90s into a single deck of cards that people are sitting around a table uh, working collectively with in, in a short period of time in a room without necessarily needing to to bring in an external party. So uh, I've been fond of it and, and, uh, and yeah, fond of, of processes that sort of uh, emerge from it as well. Um, so, uh, you know, a very basic way of starting to, to look at your work, and, and this is maybe more of an organizational tool than a game, is, is just trying to divide things up into to four categories. You know, looking for those things that fall into the, the category <coughs> of uh, high business value and, and low effort, because we know that, that that's where we get our maximum benefit, typically. You know, there's always exceptions to things, but uh, if you can do something in five hours that's going to give you eight points of business value, uh, however you measure business value, um, it definitely seems like the sort of thing to consider tackling. Uh, and, and talking about scrum poker brings us to uh, to business value poker. Is that something that anybody else, anyone here has, has worked with before? Okay, so a few people. Uh, very similar to scrum poker, except you're getting the, the, the people on the business side of the conversation uh, not to estimate the complexity of, of the, uh, the user stories that you're undertaking or the, the, the uh, the time involved with them, you're, you're getting them to estimate the value that they're going to bring to the organization, or if they're your customers, the value that they're going to bring to them as, as customers. So it's a very similar process. Uh, everybody's got a deck of cards and uh, you're going around the room and saying, you know, describing this thing in as much detail as you can. This is, uh, this is the new widget that's, that's going to uh, change the world for us and, uh, and here's why and, uh, and then everybody puts down their their, uh, their card at the same time and, and use a, a simple calculus to figure out uh, what the business value is. And that might look something like this. So if we've got uh, Jennifer and Mohammed and Pierre and Darcy, and uh, one of the things we're looking at is rebranding everything. Uh, Jennifer thinks it's five, Mohammed thinks it's three, Pierre thinks it's two, Darcy thinks it's three. They're all within uh, within one or two points of each other on this modified Fibonacci scale. And so uh, uh, we take the one with the most votes, essentially. We take, uh, take the three. Uh, event system, super valuable to Mohammed. Uh, Jennifer thinks that it, it might not add any value to the organization. In fact, it, it might uh, harm the organization somehow to have an event system. Um, and, uh, and they're so far apart that uh, they're much like in, in Scrum Poker, they have to come back and have a conversation, usually starting with the people that are on the, the far edges. So, uh, you know, Mohammed can explain 
where that extraordinary amount of business value is coming from. And Jennifer can explain uh, why it is that she thinks that there's there's no business value there at all. And then after that conversation is had, uh, you estimate again, ideally come to a, a place of balance where people have sort of met in the middle, so to speak. Make sense? Uh, so Innovation Games is a book that a fellow named Luke Homan uh, wrote almost 10 years ago. Uh, and a lot of things I'm going to talk about today come out of it, not all of them by any means. Um, but he was focused more on, on sort of sales driven conversations, but, uh, but I think that most of, of what he put together is still relevant. And, the sort of release planning conversations that, that we're talking about. Uh, so remember the future is, I think, an album title by a German prog rock band, but uh, also a, uh, a game that this gentleman came up with. And the notion is that uh, you get, let's say you've got five people in the room together uh, and you're all sort of uh, brainstorming about uh, what to do with the product, to improve it, to move it forward, to, to sort of come to a place of, of, of perfection or near perfection. So you all take a look in your imaginations at where the product is in the future. Let's say five years down the road, 10 months down the road, three months down the road, whatever makes sense. Uh, and then you take post-it notes or some other mechanism and you, you uh, you list the different features you're going to have to add to the product in order to get it to that, that new vision that you've, you've uh, come up with yourself. And, uh, and let's say you end up with five or six post-it notes out of the deal, you keep them to yourself at first. When everybody's done that process, it's sort of like scrum poker or, or business value poker. Uh, everybody reveals you know, their, their uh, sheaf of, of post-its and, uh, and then you start looking at where there's overlap. So if, if uh, Bob and, and Jane uh, both came up with, with a few tickets around an event system, you look for the ones that match, you look for the ones that are, uh, you know, Jane had one idea that was a little bit different and Bob had one that was a little bit different. And you bring together these, uh, these, these post-its uh, to, to form a sort of centralized vision from, from everybody's input. Uh, shape the product tree. Um, so this is, is an interesting way to take the results of something like that to uh, remember the future game and to, to group them together, sort of overlapping the product as it currently exists to get a sense of, of, uh, of where the balance is in your ideas. So uh, typically what you do is is create a tree-like structure on a board or, or a wall or something like that and you cluster your post-it notes on it with the ones that represent either functionality that you currently have or functionality that's sort of like step two to get to step three closer to the trunk of the tree and things that are farther out uh, at, the, at the tips of the, the branches, so to speak. And it becomes an interesting exercise because you can sometimes see that that this particular branch with this particular cluster of ideas is, is sort of overladen with the uh, with different post-it notes, and this one over here has has uh, less, so maybe it allows you to spot gaps in your thinking or, or what you've been uh, considering in terms of building out these things. It allows you to spot, you know, maybe we're giving too much focus to this particular part of the product at uh, the expense of, of something else. Uh, just gives you an opportunity to to view things through that uh, that lens of balance. Uh, sailboat uh, allows you to uh, to take that product after you've sort of decided what it is that you're building and spot things that will allow you to to sort of uh, speed up your development of it and things that might slow you down. Uh, so. Usually it takes the form of a picture like this. Forgive my uh, rudimentary uh, sketching. Uh, but you, you've got some post-its that represent things. That are, so the sailboat, first of all, uh, is, is whatever it is you're building. Uh, things on post-its 
blowing into the sails are things that are going to propel you forward, that are, are going to be beneficial to you. Like, uh, I don't know, maybe this new library has been released that's going to make it extraordinarily easy to uh, develop this particular part of the product or uh, uh, anything along those lines. Anchors are things that are going to sort of slow you down. Maybe there's a, a bottleneck review process somewhere that's, that's going to be necessary here that's going to prevent you from working as sort of swiftly as, as you'd like to or it's going to force you to think about working in a in a slightly different manner or, or forming your iterations in a slightly different way and this sort of weird jagged thing on the, the right is meant to be an iceberg and, and those are things that could you know totally uh, tip over the boat and, and prevent you from uh, achieving success. Um, is anybody familiar with, with oblique strategies? This sort of a mm -hmm. so, oh yeah. Um, so Brian, you know, uh, the musician, and uh, Peter Schmidt, the artist, uh, in the 70s, you know, always doing these artistic projects, and, and they were sort of looking for ways to, to unblock themselves creatively or to find uh, scenarios where they weren't thinking of like everything they should be, uh, or, or you know, just opportunities to sort of change context swiftly and uh, get yourself unblocked or, or, or find ideas that you might otherwise be ignoring. And they created this deck of, I think, it ended up being hundreds of cards where uh, if it was late night in the recording studio and they were sort of stuck on something, they'd pull one out and it would uh, change their perspective and they'd move on. Um, there's sort of a similar thing uh, that's been created by a gent called uh, Monchillo Deck, I'm pretty sure that's a pronunciation, uh, uh, called 35 cards. Uh, and I'll pass this around if you guys want to take a look at it. His notion is that you would take this deck and you would shuffle it out to everybody that's at the table and sort of give everybody an opportunity to, to weigh on, on each of these 35 points in, in sort of a, a linear fashion. I'm not actually convinced that that's actually the best application of this stuff, but I really like this notion of having this sort of deck of cards that allows you to to pull out and identify things that you might be missing. It allows people in conversation to sort of flag things and and bring them to people's attention, and, and they can be uh, anything. Uh, you know, there's three examples up here. Uh, making sure that, that in your estimation or, or whatnot that you're adding in. Uh, some slack time to, to account for the unaccountable. Um, uh, how does this feature make the user awesome? Pretty good question to ask. Stuff along those lines. Uh, stuff about just process, making sure that you're, you're taking appropriate notes, making sure that you're estimating things properly, making sure that you're time boxing conversations <laughs> properly, things along those lines. Uh, and then I think what has is, is very swiftly become my favorite in all of this stuff uh, is the, the $100 game. Has uh, so anyone here played the $100 game? One person, all right, so uh, two people, there we go. Um, so the notion with the $100 game is, uh, is you know, we've got that, that uh, situation that I described before. You've got, uh, let's say, 10 people sitting around the table and, and they have split interests and we have, you know, through our, our agile work, we, we empirically identify that we've got a capacity of, of uh, 35 story points a sprint or 100 story points a, a quarter or whatever it happens to be because story points are different for everybody. Uh, but uh, uh, you know that there's no way you're going to be able to accommodate everything that's that's being asked for and, and you want to encourage a, a collaborative conversation in your organization about how to to uh, uh, figure out what it is you're going to achieve over the uh, the next quarter say uh, the hundred dollar game allows everybody to be given a hundred dollars virtually uh, uh, and uh, to bid on different features or different aspects of what it's what's being proposed to be built out over over say the next quarter uh, and that typically looks something like this, where uh, you've got your your five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, twelve, twenty, however many things that you're going to undertake, and uh, and everybody goes through an exercise simultaneously, where they take their hundred dollars, 
and they spend their time on what they uh, think is the most important thing. Uh, and uh, you know, in this case, Jennifer, super keen on the rebrand, spends 50 on that and 40 on bulk email. Darcy spends zero on the rebrand. Uh, when all the money is, is spent, uh, the registration system sort of wins out is the thing that that has the, the most votes. And when I've undertaken this myself, we've usually done it in a way where we do this first round, where we don't actually speak a whole lot about like personal justifications and, and whatnot until the voting's finished. <coughs> Excuse me. And then, uh, and then, yeah, uh, when this first vote is in like this, we uh, we go around the table and everybody explains uh, why they spent the money that they spent and, and the way that they spent it. Uh, and then we go back and, and typically do another round where people adjust their bids uh, based on the input that they've had from other people. Uh, and I found this to be, uh, at least within our organization, uh, a really effective way to to define some guidelines for what we're going to build out. It doesn't always 100 percent, you know, end up being the sort of sole guiding factor in what we undertake. But more often than not, uh, what we bring into a, a given quarter is is pretty close to to what's coming out of that conversation. Uh, Typically, we're doing it in a in a room full of uh, uh, I don't know eight eight to ten people uh, with people on the the business side as well as people on the dev side taking part in the conversation and uh, yeah it has been super effective for me. Uh, does anyone want to try a quick round of a uh, hundred dollar game? Sure. All right. So Bitly slash hundred dollar game should give you access to a spreadsheet. <coughs> All right, feel free to, I think everybody should have edit access. Feel free to add yourself into a column. And, uh, and we'll do a quick round of bidding on uh, on the things involved here. All right, so I'm pretty keen on branding. Do I end at noon precisely? Must, yeah, there's 45 minutes. Sorry, we've got a little bit more time. I'm going to bet 30 on the old rebrand. 20 on the event system. I'm not particularly fond of bulk email. And registration system to me is at 25. And the tier pricing also 25. Down at the bottom of my spreadsheet, I got my 100 total. And then we can start doing an average of these things over on the right hand side and ultimately getting a sense of uh, sort of where we're uh, where we're ending up. Is this how you do it with remote people? Is there yeah, it's just, this has pretty much been our, yeah. our process. Uh, it's been effective so far. Mm -hmm. um, so it gives people a sense of things. Uh, let's see. You don't, you don't find it's important to hide other people's votes uh, during the process? It's interesting because it, I suspect it has some level of influence. And you're right, if there was some sort of like for that first round blind process, it might be improved. Uh, I haven't found that it's felt like it's colored our process too much so far, but I think I work with people that are, are fairly strong in their ideas going into these conversations. So uh, they're, they're probably less bendable at first. Uh, I definitely. You can see it, you know, you can see it in that second round change things and you can see people reacting as well to there's, you know, yeah. clearly not many people are putting dollars into this particular initiative. I guess I will abandon my points there and put them somewhere more strategic, that sort of a thing. Right. But I don't necessarily think that's a, a, a problem. It, it's, uh, yeah, just wondering if it changed the outcome. Yeah, I'm sure to a small degree at least. 
Uh, there's a bunch of other uh, games along these lines that are worth consideration. Uh, the product box where you sort of very quickly build up faux advertising for your product to, to sort of uh, come up with ideas about describing it and, and what it contains. The uh, start of your day where you sort of work through the actual real-time use of a product over, over different periods of time. Uh, uh, 2020 vision, uh, where you sort of one at a time sort uh, item A against item B in terms of importance and do that sort of binary choice thing all the way through the line to, to sort out a list. Uh, the Kanban pizza game, uh, which I'm not sure that I still fully understand but looks really interesting. <laughs> and uh, sort of an assembly line uh, look at, at how you might build something out and what needs to come first mm -hmm. and whatnot. Uh, and yeah, a bunch of books here uh, that have influenced my thinking on this and, and a bunch of blog posts as well that I think have been useful. And uh, going to the slides, bit.ly slash collaboration game. That's it. Any questions, thoughts, concerns? Go for it. So, Typically, how do you convince people to sit down to play the game? To actually participate? Is that, is that, a, is that a problem we've ever encountered? So, what's that? Free coffee. Free coffee is a good idea. Yeah. I, I, so I'll say this, in, the, in my most recent contact to the Linux Foundation at, uh, at, at New Mode, not so much, and those are organizations of new modes for less than 20 people. The Linux Foundation, when I worked for them, was maybe 160, something like that in total. And people are pretty invested in seeing things associated with their organization with Ford. Uh, I haven't worked for Miguel University in a long time, and I, I don't mean to say anything that in any way sounds disparaging, but I will suggest that when you have, you know, 3,500 people using the system that you use to build websites, and the vast majority of them have very, uh, well, some, some needs in alignment, an awful lot of them that are, 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 are spread out. And uh, yeah, uh, I think there were, were definitely situations there where, where we struggled to to get everybody to participate, uh, or, or even you know, how do you contend with those numbers, and how do you choose the right the right uh, the right representatives and whatnot? But that's more of like a fairly unique, massive organization problem, I think. I mean more like I mean more like level of hostility rather than size, right? So, in a context where you're meeting resistance, right? Have you have you contended with that specific issue? I don't necessarily mean. Could be a, could be an NGO that's just where everyone thinks you're not too busy playing sort of little games. What do you do? Um, or is that ever it's not something you've encountered possibly? Depending. I don't think I've encountered it to the the point where I would describe it as hostility. I've definitely encountered it to the point of of uh, you know, people feeling like it's it's something that that doesn't have merit or it's it's a distraction from the actual sure. conversation uh, typically I try and, and push <laughs> swiftly into to an example like the hundred dollar game where you can in five minutes just sort of <coughs> lay it out and then I think for the most part people tend to get things like this when they see it demonstrated when they can see okay this is instead of me sitting here for five hours having a conversation where it's pretty hard to to pull anything out of it that's 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 <clears throat> empirical, that's measurable, we can start things off or, or at least early on in our process get into something where we can quantify very exactly what it is that we're trying to describe in terms of our own interests and weigh them against the interests of others. And I think when when people are, are brought to understand that that that, uh, that it sort of has that simplicity to it, that it has that quantifiable, descriptive quality to it. I I think it sells itself. I have a follow up, but I'll come back to you because there's other folks. Cool. Get to it, Matt. Uh, 
uh, give examples of times you've seen this process devolve and just go totally off the rails. <laughs> and, uh, if, and if so, any uh, advice on what to deal with that? Oh, man. Um... <coughs> I think the closest examples I have to that are, are sort of two occasions. Either, you know, you end up with, let's say you've got the capacity to do six things or something like that, and you end up with the top five on the list or the top four on the list are really clearly, obviously, things that are sort of winning out, but then you've got four things under underneath that are, are uh, equal in their votes, more or less, and, uh, and the way we solve that is just by doing additional rounds of voting until people sort of get hip to the, the fact that they have to move things one way or the other, and, and usually that's worked out. Um, I think we've also seen it get tricky, and I'm fortunate to work for a company that's fairly balanced and its approach to bringing in opinions and and keen on collaboration between different teams and whatnot. But you know, you've got your completed list and then the CIO comes in or the CEO sorry, the CEO comes in and, and is, is very keen on this one particular thing over over something else. Uh, in those circumstances I've I've uh, I've generally resisted having that one opinion sort of outweigh everything else, but I mean, your company culture is perhaps different than mine, and I, I'll, I'll leave that to your personal judgment, um, and, and, and look for other solutions. So, uh, you know, we may bring in a small allotment of work to do research on something that we're not we're going to undertake in a future quarter to, to get the ball rolling on something that's been identified as, as particularly important to one particular person, uh, just to, uh, which is always, you know, doing a little bit of exploratory work of that nature if you know that, that uh, it's very important for the company to say the next quarter round to, to move that sort of thing forward is pretty beneficial as well. Uh, yeah. How often do you play those games? Because I'm wondering in a context where things would be added to backlog and some things may evolve and be not as a, much of a priority. And I think about something like, for example, the annoying thing where you need to sometimes refactor code or Google managing or the little boring stuff that does not have much value for most people, like marketing, but at the same time is required. And so I'm wondering how many times do you kind of run those games? Not every sprint, obviously, because it would be way too much time, but I guess once a month for me, well, if you're a one month sprint, not much value. So how many times do you run those games? So I, I would say we run that stuff uh, just once a quarter. And, and it's part of our, our larger one or two day quarterly planning process. But we do, uh, so in addition to, to, to building out a plan that accommodates, you know, we're going to take this and this and this and this on based on this conversation that we've had and this plan that we've had, we also tend to work with, uh, with, with quotas and, and buffers as we do agile development. I think I did a talk on this maybe four years ago that I might still have the slides for it. I'll see if I can dig those out for you. But um, and it's probably evolved a fair amount since then. But you know, we we make sure that in every sprint we set aside seven points of our capacity for for unknown stuff. And that might be security updates, that might be stuff that that's just from a, a maintenance perspective should be prioritized but is in no way glamorous. Like nobody really cares that much about about uh, whether your website is HTTPS only until you know three months later and they suddenly notice their SEO is tanking or stuff like that. You will not put these in the, in the point game. You will, you will not gain those items. You will just consider it as we need these so let's play with the rest of the amounts of point of development and see what would be the best business value of every other point. Yeah, Is that in, in, the, in the release planning, it's usually high level things and, and not necessarily s small things that sort of fall okay. into security maintenance. So it would be, you know, we want to create this event system or we want to create this uh, this SMS system or, or something along those lines, a sizable chunk of, of the product. Um, 
and then in the, 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 at the sprint level, when we're doing that sprint planning on a regular basis, and when we're going through our backlog and grooming it, we are taking the time then to, to estimate the amount of effort involved in, in, in doing like a security update or, or doing this, uh, you know, uh, AWS maintenance thing that, that's, that's probably not particularly easy to communicate to all parties involved, but yeah, making sure that that stuff has a home and that it's not ignored and that it's, it, it's sort of safeguarded, I think is fairly important. And we do that too with other things. We make sure that we've got an allotment of work around uh, UX that, that sort of goes beyond just hitting all the, the high bars we aim for with, with all our regular development, but something that allows us to go back and iterate and improve and make sure that we've got sort of a polish from, from end to end across the system. Uh, a little bit of time that's spent uh, as well on AX, making sure that, that the site is properly accessible if, if there's ever something that somehow, uh, yeah, you know, just, just clean it house, so to speak. Uh, you know, stuff that should always be undertaken in every ticket that we undertake anyway, but making sure that it's double checked and, and uh, kept solid. Um, you had another question, I think. I did. So, uh, closing the loop or following up, you know, after the fact, right? Everybody sits down and plays the game and puts whatever bets they're going to put on whatever, you know, big feature. Or whatever. Do you do any retrospective work with the results of this game? So, you know, now we went and we built it. It was actually, you know, the ratios actually work out like this. Here's what we thought it was. Here's who turns out to be good at estimating. Here's who, where, or, or here's the kind of thing we turn out to be good at estimating. Here are the kinds of things we don't. Does, is there any follow-up on that? I think I can, I don't think I'm sharing any great trade secrets or anything like that by displaying them. <laughs> I'll go back if, to last year or something just to, to give a sense of things. But usually what I do when we finish the release plan is, is I put together uh, uh, something that reflects the proposed plan. After we've done some, some high-level estimation around it, we put those totals together and then we try and fit those points into to whatever our sort of empirically determined capacity. And then I created another table that I f update from sprint to sprint where we take a look at what we've actually done and how it sort of fit into what we said we were going to do and, and, and how it hasn't. And, you know, very often we'll well, you know, we're a young startup and and uh, an opportunity comes along that we hadn't even thought of when we were in release planning and we'll change things and, and shift course and these numbers will shift. This is actually a pretty, pretty, uh, there's more extreme shifts here than we probably normally see. But uh, yeah, you can see here we decided to do this action page thing and then, uh, you know, halfway through building out, we decided we were going to make it way more fancy than we initially anticipated and, and the numbers on that sort of blew out. Um, so yeah, we, we refer to this or a table like this every sprint, uh, and, uh, and when we're doing our sprint planning uh, and even our demo, uh, I usually refer back to it and say, you know, this is what we achieved, this is what we talked about achieving, uh, and yeah, this is what we're sort of uh, uh, keeping track of that way. Because I think if you're ever looking to do another talk, people would be interested to see in that part of it. Well, you know. Yeah. So we're not just playing these games and then throwing them away, right? Like this, yeah. The point being, like, not only does this help us figure out our business value today when we're doing the release plan, but it also hooks into this bigger process. And yeah. here's what that bigger process looks like for us cool. in, in your particular case or whatever. I think people would be interested in Because I see a lot of frameworks out there in the agile market that talk about this front-end gaming. But not talk about, about how you change things as you go. But there isn't a lot of this, like, let's look back. Well, uh, cool. Well, thank you, everybody, for uh, for coming.